This video is the fourth part of our Planet Zoo yearly review series. We've covered this game and all of its DLCs with a video since its first anniversary in 2020. Check out the playlist in the description for previous seasons and a comprehensive review of the base game. Planet Zoo has once again continued its strong post-release support into 2023 with the developers showcasing perhaps their strongest array of DLCs and patches this year. In this video, we'll go through all four packs individually, their respective updates, and assess the overall state of the game through its fourth season. Let's taste the fruits of the 2023 Planet Zoo tree together. This is Planet Zoo, the Season 4 DLC review. The Grasslands Animal Pack was released in December of 2022, after the somewhat surprising end to Season 3, which saw only one animal pack in its entirety. Well, rumours of its demise were quickly suppressed with the inclusion of another pure animal DLC, with technically the most animal species of any pack so far. There's seven species of the larger habitat animals, not unlike other animal packs before it, but it also includes five species of butterfly for the new walkthrough exhibits introduced in the Twilight Pack update. The whole theme of this pack is an exploration into the southern continent's grassland habitats. South America's Patagonia and the Cerrado, Africa's iconic savanna gets some flavor, and of course, no love lost for a trip back to Australia, a pack that unites the long separated lands of Gondwana. And so, let's check it out. The Blue Wildebeest is arguably one of the most iconic African savanna hoofstock, probably only second behind the zebra. Yet its less famous cousin, the Black Wildebeest, was part of the base roster. Many people will see this as a sort of wasted slot, especially since its niche is already well covered and established. But personally, it would have been cool to see something a bit more unique, like a topi or a kudu, or even an eland. But wildebeest are one of the most populous animals on the savannah, and it's hard to argue against its ultimate inclusion. There's not much else to say about it. Um, it is unsurprisingly very compatible with a lot of the game's other savannah animals, and thus very easy to introduce to your own zoos. Definitely a beginner-friendly animal. This feline icon is an astute inclusion, possibly the most requested feline species outside of the bigger and more famous cats, which for the most part have all been represented. A resident of not only Africa, but through Arabia, the Iranian Plateau, and as far as India, the Karakau is a sure highlight of this pack. It's very well implemented. The Karakau's distinctive ear tufts are clearly on display and they represent an intermediate species for well-developed zoos. Karakaus are usually solitary creatures with strict habitat requirements, needing a semi-arid environment and plentiful of climbing space. Several fur coats are also implemented, providing some unique flavor to individual colorations. Breeding them will be a decent challenge for players. Part of this pack's refresh from the Australian continent, the emu is one half of Australia's renowned iconography, and the majestic ratite now graces the roster. It's quite thematic to include a ratite in this pack, as the group of flightless birds are distributed and famous across the Gondwana continent. It's quite fitting. The emu is portrayed quite well in game. Some individuals feature pale blue necks that have a sheen in the light. Juvenile hatchlings also have their unique appearance and will be a treat for the younger crowd. Emus also have interspecies relationship with the red kangaroo, fulfilling the Planet Zoo dream of having both these creatures together. But some recent Australian additions are also compatible, as we'll come to see. The main wolf is a personal favorite of mine and one very high on the list of potential inclusions in a grasslands themed pack, so here it is. South America's defining canine is famous for its appearance in North American and European zoos, and now can be inclusion in your own in-game zoo. Maine wolves are distinguishable from other canines for their slender long legs and fuzzy silver grey fur on their nape and around their neck, most prominent in adult individuals. They breed quite prolifically with litters of two to six, so they make a decent quality specimen for conservation credit farming. Perhaps surprisingly, they have interspecies enrichment with the capybara and giant anteater. 
I don't think real life zoos would ever attempt this, but the main wolf is known to stick to much smaller prey than these large animals, and they are omnivorous with fruits and vegetable matter, making up large portions of their diet. Nevertheless, interesting to utilize if you want to save some space. An armadillo has been introduced to Planet Zoo. It's the most common of them all. The nine banded armadillo is widely distributed over South, Central and North America, appearing readily in the wild or in captivity. This is another animal that utilizes the burrow and with its small land requirements, makes a suitable species for low footprint habitats to take advantage of spare nooks and crannies around the zoo. The other Australian animal in this pack, the red-necked wallaby, is one of the most well-represented marsupials in captivity worldwide because of their hardiness and friendly nature, which makes them overall an adaptable species. In-game, their inquisitiveness and playfulness makes them great pairings with the emu or their larger kangaroo cousins, but I find them better for smaller parks or more casual builds as they are a lower maintenance and lower footprint animal. It's a perfect complementary species for an Australian walkthrough habitat. This one is a pretty unsurprising pick. Striped hyenas are perhaps not as famous as the spotted, but as widely distributed over much of Africa and Eurasia, it is commonly encountered by humans and often cited as much of a pest as it is culturally significant. Nevertheless, I think a lot of predictions for a grasslands pack idea has come true with the striped hyena. In game, they require quite a lot of space and their agility will encourage creativity in implementing verticality with ledges, cliffs and hills. They are suitable as solitary or in single female, multiple male groupings, with gregarious inclinations meaning male offsprings will be tolerated in the pack long after they mature. For the exhibit species, we don't have one, not just two, but five species, well technically. The cloudless sulphur, European peacock, Menelaus blue morpho, monarch and the old world swallowtail are included in this butterfly booster pack, available in the walkthrough exhibit. Exhibit animals are seen as pretty underwhelming overall, so introducing at a time a group of species at once from one animal group is sure to be a popular trade-off, and I hope this is a thing for the future where frontier developments can implement some of the more minor, less significant animal groups, especially those for the walkthrough exhibit. As an animal pack, the trade-off is however not much scenery, besides an animal sign for each of the new species. The butterfly signs are however a 3D mechanical contraption that slowly flutters its wings, opening and closing, which is something different that can be used for a range of use cases. The Grasslands Animal Pack scenario is the Permamarca Educational Reserve, and I absolutely love the fact Frontier are continuing the career scenarios that were revived with the last Twilight Pack. It's much easier to play through objectives if there's a bit of context or narrative to back it up. Anyways, this scenario is based in Patagonia, a reserve intended to rehabilitate grassland species, run by a new character introduced, Tiffany Summers. It functions a bit of a tutorial with a lesson on the new butterfly walk-in exhibit, but eventually players will have to rehabilitate rescued animals, such as a Galapagos tortoise or a lion cub, and then learn to build and perfect the new tour mechanic introduced with this patch, whilst accommodating all the rescue animals. That's right, one of the biggest introductions with patch 1.12 is the new guided tours. Using the tour point object, players can construct a route through the zoo for an educator staff member to escort tour groups. Tours bring in extra revenue on top of the normal entry fees, and it's a chance to utilize the educator staff role a bit more, and of course boost that education rating. It's great because you can manage multiple tour routes, charge different prices for them, and have high star rating personnel as guides to boost efficiency. There's some experimentation as tours also receive a rating. Just remember to add one or more intermission points for some food, drink, and rest for both guests and staff. There are now some new super rare additions to color morph varieties. The sleek striped king cheetah, the black timber wolf, the pale reindeer and golden Formosan black bear will be highly sought after specimens on the market. A new feature for purely creative players is the diorama mode, 
A function to remove the map edges and terrain skirt for a blank canvas where players can flex their own skills and push the game's creative tools to the limit. I can't say I'm at all interested in any of this, but Diorama Mode makes Planet Zoo transcend the bounds from just a zoo simulation game into an art block ecosystem designer. Supporting the Grasslands pack but free for all players is the addition of three new grass types with a dry and lush variant that helps to recreate the American prairies, but these don't look out of place even for an African savannah theme. A few construction items are also included to customize walkthrough exhibits further, such as mesh netting panels. For some quality of life feature additions, a new habitat visibility heat map shows the quality of viewing angles for any selected habitat, a useful tool to improve enclosure designs and to maximize the guest experience, and a bulldozer tool to well bulldoze everything, enough said really. Overall a huge patch with support for animal variety, simulation mechanics and creativity. The Tropical Pack released in April of 2023 and sees an exploration into one of the most popular biome themes, and one that really helps to bolster the roster with species overlooked from previous pack concepts. As a scenery pack as well, it boasts 200 plus scenery pieces celebrating traditional Indonesian architecture. Although visually and conceptually similar to the base game's Nile Monitor, the Asian Water Monitor was always in a decent position for reptilian inclusion an outside chance to make it into the previous wetlands animal pack for instance because there's really not that many tropical reptiles that would warrant a habitat slot. In game it's virtually the same as the Nile Monitor in terms of mechanics, be sure to include a lot of water in their exhibits. Possibly one of the most surprising picks all season, the fossa from Madagascar is considered a highly sought after specimen for many zoos around the world, with the richest and most prestigious institutions showcasing it. This has made it a possible inclusion for a variety of pack ideas over the seasons. The fossa in-game requires relatively little space compared to a lot of other predators, but quite a substantial need for climbing area. As extremely agile animals, they will be sure to wow guests with their verticality. The La Gibbon was a high possibility for the Southeast Asian Animal Pack back in Season 2. Eventually its endangered cousin, the Siamang, pipped its spot in the Conservation Pack. A refresh for this tropical theme sees the La Gibbon take a privileged flagship spot. Renowned for their brachiation, the introduction of that mechanic back in Patch 1.10 means that this is the second species to use brachiation alongside the Siamang. And alongside the Siamang, La Gibbons can be part of combined interspecies exhibits. The Red River Hog is a popular favourite from the Central African Forest, quite possibly one of the most famous species from the pig family due to its appearance in many western zoos. Red River Hogs are very easy to accommodate in game with their easy approachability and playful nature, allowing them to be combined with a lot of other African primates in multi-species habitats such as bonobos. The brown throated sloth is the most recognizable sloth variety, but it was difficult to justify their inclusion before in, say, the base game or South America pack because of its weird niche between not quite being a habitat animal or an exhibit species. Well, with the introduction of the walkthrough exhibit feature, the sloth is now the third animal to utilize this space after the Egyptian fruit bat and last pack's butterflies. Sloths are characteristically lazy and slow, but their popularity transcends into the guests in game. A great idea for a showcase in any South American themed area of your zoo. Precisely 197 pieces of scenery and 13 pieces of foliage alongside several blueprints are featured in this pack. The mossy stone, dark colored, aged architecture is useful in constructing Southeast Asian themed, even Mesoamerican, Aztec or Incan themed rainforest temples. Think Machu Picchu or Angkor Wat. Despite its name, the Indonesian temple set will be quite adaptable to a lot of tropical rainforest locales and I can definitely see adaptations into an Indiana Jones or Tomb Raider style thematic. The foliage is also pretty damn cool with a selection of iconic 
parasitic and predatory plants from Southeast Asia, like the pitcher or the rafflesia. They're all smaller plants that make it easier to fit into walkthrough exhibits, for instance. Overall, the scenery on offer is mouth-watering and forms a strong appeal for the entire pack. Continuing the pack's Indonesian focus is the Summer Project Scenario, another addition to the revived career mode. Here, players will be helping out the young socialite in creating a paradise tropical zoo in the heart of an ancient Indonesian temple, where it's sort of revealed that Tiffany Summers, the socialite that you're working for, is potentially Dominic Meyer's daughter. Anyways, this is a tedious scenario where players will eventually have to work towards breeding nine different species and releasing them into the wild. The park is a great foundation though for a challenge and sandbox zoo, with its elaborate walkthrough lima habitat and ready-made exhibits for all manner of aquatic animals and primates. There has been a rework of the social system at large with patch 1.13. The introduction of outsiders portrays the individuals that are not involved or are rejected from the social group because of gender ratios or maturation. Dominance displays and fights are now directed at outsiders instead of randomly in the group. For instance, here the Red River Hogs live in social circles consisting of only one male defending his harem from outside males. As a result, any non-alpha, even his own male children, are rejected from the circle upon maturation. Removing the alpha in question gives a chance to integrate new genetic diversity from another male lineage. However, they will take some time to ingratiate themselves into the new group. Furthermore, siblings of the same parents also bond, forming lifelong friendly relations that persist into adulthood. Non-familial individuals also have a low chance to bond naturally, such as a mating pair. Bonded individuals do not fight each other, even when considered outsiders, so this is a flexible change to allow multiple siblings of the same family to coexist with one another well into adulthood, regardless of the species' social systems. Brachiation has now been extended to vines, trees and beams, no longer completely limited to the metal climbing frame pieces. Also, there is now a climbing asset toggle on scenery items. This makes it extremely useful to enable or disable climbing to prevent glitching or escapes. I like to disable climbing on shelter buildings, for instance, while enabling it on foliage pieces so primates can interact with trees as a natural enrichment. The addition of knoll paths is another quality of life feature. Building natural paths with the curb on the ground turned off defaults to a completely invisible path, useful for paths on custom-made surfaces such as in buildings or through walkthrough exhibits. To assist construction, there's now a multi-axis movement with handles, allowing movement of pieces across two axes at once. So, a huge patch featuring behavioral updates to social groups and brachiation support for the new law given, and possibly one of the best construction quality of life features with the double-axis movement handle. The Arid Animal Pack released in June of 2023 and finally brings to the roster a score of animals that are properly desert themed, with representation from mainly the Saharan, Arabian and Central Asian deserts. This pack also returns back to the alternating scheme between scenery and animal packs, so hopefully Frontier are resuming normal operations as I do believe animal packs represent much better value for the consumer. Once again, the Arid Animal Pack introduces seven habitat animals and one exhibit species. A lot of animals here are some of the earliest requested species since the game launched. A lot of overlap with Zoo Tycoon 2's roster as well, so it tugs a bit on the nostalgia strings and plenty of critically endangered varieties for the conservation wary. The Adax is a critically endangered antelope extremely well adapted to the dry Sahara and one exceptionally popular with the public for their unique appearance and commonality in captivity. A welcome inclusion all round for this reason, Adax require large spaces and a lot of sand to mimic their natural tolerances for arid regions. Of course, they have plenty of interspecies enrichment with a lot of the other animals in this pack, allowing for a desert-themed mixed species hoofstock habitat. The Crested Porcupine finally sees representation from this famed and long-time coming group of rodents. Small and hardy, porcupines take up little space and can stay in small groups without any gender ratio infighting, so they make suitable beginner-friendly, easy-to-breed species, and also another species that uses the burrow. 
an exceptional species to be added, rumors of the black rhinoceros have swirled since the game was announced, and made all the more confusing when pieces of its scenery were part of the base game's Africa scenery set. It's taken almost four years for one of the most iconic mammals in the world to finally grace the game in all of its glory. These animals have huge space requirements and are difficult to breed, but make up for their appeal and rating towards guests in-game, an overall intermediate challenge for players. The Dharma gazelle is another critically endangered antelope from the same biozone as the Adax, though much more niche and less renowned. It is certainly an outfield candidate, less desired than perhaps other antelope varieties, and does seem like a filler pick overall. Nevertheless, the Dharma gazelle is a supplementary species that pairs well with the other animals in this pack. The eponymous dromedary is the first thought everyone thinks of when it comes to the camel, and so it was a bit of a surprise that the Bactrian pipped its spot in the base roster. Here now, it represents the flagship species of this pack and a great starter animal. Be sure to put them into a sizable habitat for future expansion as, again, a lot of animals in this pack are suitable alongside each other. The sand cat is a well-adapted animal to the sandy deserts of the Sahara, Arabia and Central Asia, as well as appearing readily in many zoos. Although not as glamorous as some of the larger cats, its resemblance to house cats might make them a cult classic among players, so although they are somewhat small and unassuming, don't sleep on their cuteness. Planet Zoo finally sees a donkey variety, well, the wild variety, in the Somali wild ass. It's not a particularly inspired choice, I'll have to say, with its behavior virtually the same as zebras, but it is another critically endangered species and is different from the unusual antelope that we see too often from this continent. This animal has interspecies enrichment with the dromedary, adax, and ostrich, but it does have more of a preference for stony, rocky deserts over completely sandy terrain. Finally, for the exhibit species, we have the Desert Horn Viper. A resident of the Sahara and Arabian deserts, the Horn Viper's namesake features make it immediately distinguishable from other snakes. But after seeing the wondrous walkthrough exhibit animals from the previous packs and the fact the game has a gluttony of snake species already, I can't help but feel slightly underwhelmed. Once again, as an animal pack, there's no scenery outside of animal signs for each of the species. The included scenario continues the saga of Tiffany Summers and her exorbitant spending and misplaced handling of zoological parks, this time continues into the nestled ruins of an ancient fortress in Saudi Arabia. Players will be tasked to essentially build a zoo from scratch around the surrounding structures, exhibit a variety of desert, arid and savanna favorites, of course including the new species of the pack, before constructing a viable safari track throughout the park. The base map is a great starter zoo though, with laid out spaces and nooks and crannies ready to be adapted into habitats that require little construction effort. Patch 1.14 contains a few nifty features for customization and movie making. Firstly, staff uniforms are now available meaning players can customize their coloration. Free foliage comes in the form of more creosote and nitraria bush varieties. A cool animal behavior introduced is that both camel species and llamas will often spit at guests, so put some water troughs near a permeable fence and watch the magic happen. However, guests actually consider this unfriendly behavior, so you can prevent this by making barriers high or block the view. Finally, there's some new camera modes, a scenic camera and a cinematic route camera. These have no gameplay value, but are aimed at content creators making zoo tour or showcase videos. Pretty cool actually, especially the cinematic mode as it's easy to use and way more functional than the in-game camera controls, but mostly irrelevant for all other players. And that's it for patch 1.14, a pretty small underwhelming patch with very niche features. The final pack released before Planet Zoo's 4th anniversary is the Oceania pack, a return to Australia, but not only that, the Oceania pack is a chance to adapt species outside of the Australian mainland, 
and that's exactly what's on offer, with four habitat species and an exhibit animal that once again utilizes the walkthrough exhibit. All of the animals in this pack are either island or coastal inhabitants, therefore small in size and useful for condensed spaces. Furthermore, there's another 200 plus scenery pieces themed around the Pacific Islands, native architecture and coastal beach surf culture. First up is the little penguin, and damn are they truly little. One of the smallest habitat animals in the game, but still requires ample swimming space. Little penguins flourish in large flocks and their breeding speed makes them quite an economical starter animal to keep the funds or conservation credits flowing in. They interact with a lot of water-based enrichment introduced through the patches over the seasons, and it's another animal that utilizes the burrow. The flagship and a most astonishing species inclusion, the Kiwi of New Zealand is by far the most remarkable of bird inclusions ever in the Planet Zoo game, mostly because it is a fairly obscure animal. It does appear as a valued asset in some of the most prestigious zoos around the world, such as the Bronx, Columbus, Antwerp and Berlin zoos. Difficult to breed in real life and in game, this behavior mimics their captive notoriety and will present itself as an interesting challenge for players. Another tiny critter is one immensely popular with the crowd, although perhaps not very famous outside of Australia. Known from southwestern portions of the continent where their most famous populations are on offshore islands. They are known for their friendly nature even with humans and they can be exhibited in walkthrough habitats or paired in larger exhibits with other Australian varieties such as with emus or red-necked wallabies. From the island of Tasmania comes the Tasmanian Devil, a hyper carnivorous marsupial. The Tasmanian Devil is a popular attraction in Australia with a few specimens in some well-funded zoos abroad in Europe and North America. Voracious eaters that consume a lot of food, they are also another animal difficult to breed Though their main challenge is their short lifespan actually, about 5-6 to six years on average and so they lack the longevity of other animals, but at the expense of quite a high appeal rating. The final animal is another addition to the wonderful walkthrough exhibit feature, the spectacled flying fox. The second bat to be added into the roster after the Twilight Pack's Egyptian fruit bat. Despite the great push for another bat species, I can't help but feel Maybe a tree kangaroo would have been great, building on from the sloth in the tropical pack or a gliding possum for some marsupial uniqueness. This would have been a great time to also add birds into the walkthrough exhibit, taking advantage of New Guinea's rich avian fauna. The scenery in this pack is indicative of a touristy, resort-like Pacific Islands motif. Lots of thatch and woven bark pieces for village huts and lots of beach themed accessories and props. My favorite pieces are the tiki lamps and statues, adding a bit of Hawaiian flair. The blueprints are some of the best out of all the DLCs, with pre-made architecture for archways, natural scenes, or facilities and buildings. For instance, there's a great restaurant cafe blueprint with integrated upstairs and outside seating, and an interactive walkthrough exhibit in a Pacific Island thatched village setting. The foliage pieces brings to the game more ferns and unique palms, such as the cabbage tree, king and silver fern, and the towering Nikau palm. And some of the most unique rocks to be added, faux lava rocks to create volcanic environments, my favorite new rock piece. The Oceana Pack scenario, Goodwin Family Wildlife Park, sees the player return to service Emma Goodwin, daughter of the game's guide and mentor, Bernie. Here in the Chatham Islands, the player must essentially build a park from scratch with very little starting money and a lone red panda to get started. There is a focus on bringing on board species from Oceania, not just from the new pack, but focusing on habitat enrichment and plant diversity, eventually flourishing into a thriving zoo. The final gauntlet is breeding and releasing nine different animal species. The map itself is a wonderful base for a starter zoo as it features ready-made architecture, lots of intricate scenery, a fully built staff precinct and cleared out sections suitable for a variety of habitat spaces and of course a lot of water terrain for aquatic animals. Now for some highlights of the accompanying update. 
Patch 1.15 adds the new temperate Oceania biome. This is essentially an adaptation of a coastal biome with lots of clear blue water, sandy beaches, and a temperate climate. And it's the biome shown in the scenario map, differing greatly from the northern temperate biomes as it supports more of a semi-tropical setting. The patch brings another major feature in viewing domes, an attraction that will allow guests to get amazingly close, well, literally inside into the habitat alongside the animals, with no stress penalty on the animals themselves. The viewing dome is especially useful for either large open exhibits that need more viewability coverage, or for smaller animals that can often be obscured by foliage, fencing, or scenery. Do keep in mind that adding the viewing dome and its entrance deducts from the total area available for the animal. Finally, some free oceanic themed scenery to go alongside the pale DLC, such as signage for the viewing dome, super dark charcoal colored rocks to support the volcanic themes, and two varieties of foliage in the Kaha Kaha and the Golden Sand Sedge. Man, what a roster this brings to the table. A revisit to South America, Africa, and Australia that brings with it so many iconic, highly requested animal species that is well represented in real life captivity with a booster pack injection of butterflies to the walkthrough exhibit concept. I think this is it. I think this is my first 10 out of 10 pack. It's not the perfect roster, but it's damn well close enough, cemented by a strong patch that brings guided tours and animal color morphs. The tropical pack boasts a strong roster of animals from the rainforest regions of the world. The fossa, red river hog, and la gibbon are almost all flagship quality species. The sloth really pushes the potential limit of what can be done with the walkthrough exhibit, and so we'll watch that space for further additions and yet it comes loaded with relevant and useful scenery, from rainforest temples to iconic jungle plants, an all-round amazing pack, and one of my favorites of all time, 8 out of 10. The Arid Animal Pack is very similar in scope to the Africa Pack, with a score of less appealing animals that have come too late in the lifespan for a game that has already matured. Many of these animals should have been put into the base roster, Four years later, packs should really be pushing boundaries like the rest of the season's other DLCs. Instead, it falls back on mainly Hoofstock and other uninspired picks to carry this theme. By far the worst animal pack to date, so despite its value in number of species offered, it receives a mediocre 5 out of 10. All of the animals here are tiny in mass. That's not to say it's a bad thing, but they do lack the prestige and appeal of larger animals. And I feel the overall potential is still unrealized for this, what, third dive into the region now after Australia and the Grasslands DLCs? With tree kangaroos, for instance, vastly more popular, yet ignored again. But the animals on offer are reasonably quirky and kind of unique, and the pack is further carried by exceptional scenery items and a great patch to boot, and so it becomes a pretty decent overall pack, 7 out of 10. As a comparative reminder, here's what we rated the previous DLCs. So, Grasslands is my new favorite animal pack, and I think it represents extremely good value. The tropical pack rivals my other favorites in the Southeast Asia, North America, and conservation packs, whilst the arid pack leaves a little more to be desired. Oceania is a very solid pack on the same wavelength as Europe and the first Australia pack. Resultingly, via the average scores, this is my highest rated overall season. This year's anniversary update also brings another free animal to the table, the collared peccary, a widespread pig-like mammal inhabiting all manner of biomes from the deserts of Mexico, the jungles of the Amazon, to the grasslands of the Cerrado. Preferring large herds, they also have lots of interspecies enrichment, such as with capybara. Hugely welcome addition. It's not the greatest pick in the world, but that's what free patches are all about. Long may it continue. Celebrating the fourth birthday alongside the launch of the peccary are some new balloons at the Looney Balloon store, including, of course, a peccary, orangutan, lima, and red deer style balloons. Overall, the state of Planet Zoo in 2023 
has incrementally improved with some neat additions, but no longer the volume of improvements indicative from previous seasons. I think the core of the game has matured, and so there's very little more that can really elevate it. And so we're looking mainly more to future species additions to complement the 172 species in the game and make this already the largest and most comprehensive zoo game even greater. Another hearty season has finished and we move on to hopefully more and more ambitious expansion for what is clearly now a genre defining game in Planet Zoo. Frontier Development's willingness to re-examine old continents such as South America and Australia in newer and newer thematic ideas does mean that animals previously ignored and overlooked always have a chance to re-emerge. And of course, one lucky animal gets the spotlight with each anniversary update. I'm sitting here still waiting for birds though, so let's hope we can wing it in 2024. <laughs> this was Planet Zoo, the Season 4 DLC review. If you've enjoyed this video, like and subscribe as we play through and await Season 5. If you want to fund content like this further, consider subscribing on Patreon for as little as a dollar a month.